Here I stand, end of turn six. Well, Habsburgs won. What happened? England and France could not overcome their differences. They uh, left the Ottomans in a position where GIA could fight on, but nobody's helping me, and clearly it's in my best interests to end this war. The Ottomans were willing to take a hit if other countries were willing to join in. Nobody was. Uh, asking the papacy to attack the Ottomans, or the Habsburgs, is a little tough to do. Um, they might have joined in. I mean, they certainly would have if the Habsburgs hadn't gotten their last victory point, uh, if it had been that close. They certainly would have and gone and fought in Italy. But as it stands, uh, England and France both held the death cards for their leaders. Uh, Francis died and Henry II took his place. And Henry VIII died in England and Edward VI became world's ruler. In both cases, this weakens their military position. Both players had some military cards, but neither had enough cards to really face declaring war as well as fighting a war against somebody as powerful as the Habsburgs. So I guess the hope was maybe, and the English had a card that uh, uh, they thought would kind of slow the Habsburg growth down. Maybe the Protestants are enough of a speed bump that we can gain another turn or something. I don't know. Uh, it was a bad decision. I didn't realize well, I did realize how dangerous they were with their huge hand of cards. Um, their victory points weren't that high. They were in the low 20s, uh, 21 or 22. Um, but with the points they got off the Ottoman victory, which ended up being three because... Uh, The Ottomans uh, wanted to get their, their city, their key back as well. Um, it just didn't seem too likely. So what happens? Well, the first thing the Habsburgs do is they pick on the Ottomans some more and throw them a foreign war. In case this do it doesn't end this turn, and it didn't look like it would from their point of view. Yeah, they had this huge hand of cards, but it was crap. Uh, they didn't have all that many points. Actually, I think uh, you know, they had to be around 22 um, after the war, which means they were at like 19 before when this decision was being made. So this was actually a huge jump of like six points in the turn. Uh, so they were not thinking they could make it. Um, their cards were small for the most part. But... Uh, they won the major battles um, around Wittenberg and took that in Brandenburg and oh, I don't know what else. And ended up knocking out pretty much uh, the Protestant leadership and the way was open to Maine, so they took it. There had been a brief stab over towards Vienna and towards Prague. But they got lucky in a battle, and, you know, it was that close. So, what else happened this turn? Not a lot. The British and French skirmished over Calais. Um, British built up their navy. But, for the most part, neither of them had a great hand and couldn't really move forward. Plus, they were seeing how potent um, the Habsburgs were. The other thing is the papacy, uh, while the Protestants were busy actually fighting a land war, took advantage of it and uh, Catholicized a number of spaces, built a Jesuit uh, university in Cologne. The first two Jesuit universities were built by the Protestant play of the cards. So they ended up in Malta and uh, Sardinia. <laughs> That's what happens <laughs> when uh, the Protestants get to decide where the, the Jesuit universities are. 
Um, and I, I don't know if that would be that different. Say the British, they might. Everyone else might actually put them in Germany, depending on how well the Protestants are doing. Um, so the Papacy managed to gain a lot of ground. They actually got uh, the Master of Italy, Chet. Uh, card finally got played, and they were sitting on enough territories to get it. They also captured Florence this turn, just to solidify it. Uh, so what do I think of the game? Well, I think it's pretty damn terrific, actually. <laughs> First thing, this is the game, the first game, where I feel totally comfortable with the CDG system. Why? Uh, maybe some is getting familiar with, eh, you know, play a card, get points. But I don't think it's actually that much. I think what it really came down to is these fixed events in decks where you kind of have to know what cards are coming, and you kind of have to know how many, uh, you know, what, what the sequence of the play is, etc. The deck in this game is huge, and everybody shares it. There's the, some more of it. Here are the cards that were removed. There aren't that many of them. Let's get them in here. Nice little pile. And there's still a few more left to be added to the deck. But what it turns out as, you don't know what's going to happen each turn. I mean, the ran the randomness in the deck is high enough that the random events really are random events. Uh, I think too many of the games worry too much about maintaining either a historical flow, which this, with its mandatory events and its adding cards, etc., manages to promote without enforcing. Um, and I like that. It's, too many of the others have this feeling that it's almost a pre-programmed game, and there may be some changes due to events, but you're going to see event A in your hand, and you're going to be able to play it. So if you own the deck, you know what's coming. It's like playing a game of magic. You know what you're going to get. You just don't know what order it's going to come in, you know? And... You control a lot about it. You might want to call your deck. You might want to do this, that, and the other. Um, I think this wins out, and it kind of gets rid of some of the aspects of CDGs, but I think it's those aspects that have been my trouble spot more than anything else. Uh, anyhow, I've rated the game a 9. Um, I think it definitely deserves that. The question is, does it deserve a 10? Hard to tell. It's a little lighter than I like uh, to usually give a 10 to. But I'll have to, you know, I, I, I don't give 9s and 10s easily. Uh, I don't think anything's gotten a 10 without many, many plays. And I'm not going to give one on the first play, <laughs> no matter what. Uh, will it grow there? I don't know. Again, I, th there's a lot about it that's much lighter than I like for, something, for handling this kind of subject. I think it's about perfect for the level that it's at. And so it probably deserves a 10, but the level that it's at is part of what I decide. So for example, I don't think there's a single tactical game, and there certainly is no operational game that I've given a 10 to. Uh, I don't think I've given a 9 to an operational game. I like big, complex, strategic games. Um, and I like some abstract games. But beyond that, it's really hard for me to give the highest rating or something that's in a genre uh, that I'm not as thrilled with. Now, this matches with genre. Uh, it's in a very interesting period. It's got this wonderful interplay of, um, you know, in the multiplayer with the diplomacy and, and, and the way the points work. It, it, it's, uh, it's anybody's game, really, for most of the game. So I like all those factors a lot, but it's going to be tough to, to push it to the 10. Anyway, uh, I would definitely recommend this uh, to people who like CDGs, to people who don't particularly like CDGs because it does not have some of the aspects that bother me about them. Um, and I, I suspect that would be the case with others as well. I, I, I think it's a terrific, uh, very l nice, light handling of the subject. Uh, definitely better than the only other one on Mighty Fortress. Okay.